Большое спасибо за приглашение. Очень весело посмотреть на такую группу замечательных людей. Я в, еще ни разу не презентовал на русском языке. И поэтому у меня такая дилемма, презентовать на русском языке или сделать немножко более обучающий семинар на английском языке. Может, на английском? Окей. Okay. Мне просто было, все равно на русском было бы немножко сложнее, просто когда учишься... Я, я, был, я на самом деле с Вестеха, я закончил ФОП в 1994 году. Но я занимался физикой высоких энергий и никогда биологией не занимался здесь. Поэтому всю биологию я учил на английском языке там. Вот. Поэтому я реально терминов не очень хорошо знаю на русском языке. Окей, okay, so what I'll tell you today is um, how we model biological molecules, and this uh, this is not something that is particularly um, easy to approach because they live in mul at, in, multi in multiple scales simultaneously. So if you think about uh, biological processes, they happen at starting femtosecond time scales where you have um, uh, photoactivation or inactivation uh, or some uh, photochemical reactions, for example, uh, all the way to proteins that behave at time scales of uh, human life, uh, such as protein aggregation, for example, processes such as protein aggregation, and that spans years. So we really want to cover time scales from femtoseconds to years. Right? So there is no single computational or experimental tool that can do that. The same thing work, uh, happens for length scales, and the, time, and the length scales is even more dramatic in a sense. All right. What I'll do today, I'll describe tools that we have been developing over the past 20 years um, to approach biological molecules. Um, to, uh, and these tools include tools to build and design. Design like in an art studio where you actually draw a protein on a piece of paper and then put amino acid sequence and then make them in, in the lab and then see what they do uh, to uh, your cells. Um, I'll describe tools that... Oh, okay, that's perfect. <laughs> I'll describe tools how uh, we... Uh, deal with the molecules that we build because in computers, because whenever you build molecules in computers, of course, as a mind of a computational person, you think that whatever you build is perfect. But then when, by the time you come to the lab and you make it and you see a, a clump, uh, nothing is working, you realize there is something more to the just an algorithm. You really need to make sure that your protein looks like a protein. And then you start comparing to real proteins and you see, oh, but we have a lot of holes here or a lot of unsatisfied hydrogen bonds or something else. So some interactions that are supposed to be there but are not there or vice versa. Um, so is there a way to... Uh, ah, okay. Um, I'll describe a way how, how we target proteins. For example, with small molecules, and why do we need that? Is because if we want to find drugs, we want to figure out how to put small molecules on a protein and affect its function and structure. And that's called docking. And I'll describe why this is so, such a hard problem and what we have done to solve that. Uh, along the way, I'll describe tools that we have developed to study the diseases. And what we really interested in my lab is to major, uh, actually several, but two major uh, diseases. One of them is called amyotropic lateral sclerosis. Is, uh, if you guys know uh, Stephen Hawkins. Yeah, so Stephen Hawkins has the disease and, and uh, luckily he is alive. Most people die within one to two years. So this is a fatal motor neuron degenerative disease uh, and it's uh, very fascinating uh, and I was actually deliberating whether I should talk about that story rather than this one, but I think this is more educational in a sense. I'll also talk about cystic fibrosis. Actually, I will not skip ALS, but I'll talk about cystic fibrosis, which is in Russian, uh, mucoviscetos. Yes, that's what I learned. Uh, it's an interesting disease that, uh, in, uh, that is uh, genetic uh, in 90% of the cases. Uh, most uh, kids, they live until maybe 20, maybe 30, and then uh, inevitably people die. And so uh, currently there are 
first hopes that are appearing on the market that uh, try to treat this, that attempt to treat this disease. And uh, we are very proud to be part of this crew that is helping to find the cure. I'll describe a much more fun project as how we control proteins in living cells and making them cells dense and uh, do stuff for you uh, when you activate them with, lights, uh, with light or drugs. Um, these are beautiful mountains. <laughs> All right, so um, the tools. So I came from physics background, and so when, I, uh, when we start thinking about simulations of molecules, um, when we started th thinking about simulations of molecules, we were thinking, uh, we were dealing with the whole field that has been developed of simulating molecules. How do you simulate molecules? You take Newtonian equations of motions, physics, right? F equals ma, right? So you calculate all the forces that act on the particles, and you compute uh, acceleration, you compute velocities, you update velocities, you update coordinates, and you advance the system by the small amount of delta t. And you make sure that delta t is so small that you don't miss anything, right? So that's called integration. So the integration-based uh, algorithms that have been developed, and f uh, people, three people got Nobel Prize to, uh, to do the integration algorithms. Unfortunately, they are very slow. And so because they are slow, we wanted to do something else. I was a graduate student in Boston University, and I was thinking, what can we do to make it much faster? And luckily for us, back in the 1940s, uh, the original molecular dynamics has, uh, has been, when original MDU has been proposed, it was based not on the solving Newtonian equations of motions, but it was based on solution of energy and momentum conservation of ballistic equations of motion. So instead of uh, integrating, uh, integrating the processes, uh, integrating the system, what uh, was happening is people were looking for events in the system. What will happen? What, when is the people were searching? What is the next? two particles, what are the next two particles going to collide? And we would advance the whole system by this delta t necessary for these two particles to collide. Okay? So delta t is not fixed. Right? So all we do is we need to find the next two particles in the system that will collide first. And since, we, since the system is fully deterministic, we know the coordinates and velocities of all particles, we know how the delta t necessary to advance the whole system uh, by this delta t. Does it make sense? So instead of integration, we search. And search algorithms scale as n log n, while integration algorithms scale as n cube. So you can see there is a dramatic acceleration uh, in, in this uh, just by uh, applying a totally the same physics, but totally different uh, approach in solving the, um, solving the system. And so DMD algorithm itself, it's, it rests on fundamental physical principles, energy and momentum conservation. So what all we need to do, since we know uh, velocities and coordinates of the particles, we can pre-compute table of collision times and find rank order them and find the first particles that will collide. And then instead of constantly recomputing these delta t's, we can just update these collision tables. So this, the, in fact, we uh, uh, made the algorithm uh, scale as log n instead of n log n. So the algorithm is so fast that we can actually simulate back in the 2000, early 2000, uh, end of 90s, simulate protein folding, which was quite remarkable. When people were looking for 10 nanosecond trajectories, we were able to see how proteins fold when proteins folding at the second time scales, uh, millisecond to second time scales. That was a major breakthrough for us. Uh, but the problem was DMD is just an engine, right? It's just a motor in a car. That's it. You need to give the rules of the game, and that's called force field. So it took us 12 more years to develop, oops, to develop this force field, which we call Medusa. And the force field actually is very similar to charm and traditional force field and Rosetta. Uh, but we develop uh, it, uh, it in a different fashion, and it's a long, long, it's a long story how we did it. But it includes Van der Waals terms, repulsion and attractions, uh, interaction with the solvent, and lots of hydrogen bond interactions. So we have donors and acceptors uh, present there, 
but they, uh, their interaction depends on the environment where they're sitting. So don't pay attention to this very uh, cumbersome formula. It doesn't really matter. But my point is that we have all the same sort of terms that you would find in a traditional force field is just adapted and actually made, in a sense, more, much more explicit uh, here with respect to hydrogen bonds. And that was actually critical. In fact, hydrogen bonds in our case are not two-body interactions, but four-body interactions, because their interactions depend not only on the distance, but also on the relative orientation of the donor and acceptor. And that turns out very critical when you want to design proteins and orient beta sheets and alpha helices with respect to each other. And I, I'll show you the structure. So if you've never seen proteins, I'll show you. Um, so after that, we were able to fold proteins. So we would take fully stretched chain, basically a linear chain, which proteins would never be there in any way, but, uh, and we let them fold. And you see small proteins, they would fold to their native state. And so the gray one is the crystal structure, and the colored one is uh, what we find in, as a lowest energy state in the simulations. You see it finds its native state very nicely. Native state means ground state, right? And so we can fold it many, many times. As a result, we can even compute the folding rate, and for example, for these two proteins. And while we cannot be precise in the, uh, in the folding rate, we cannot actually accurate, uh, we cannot be, uh, predict correctly uh, the folding rate experimental ones because we've, we don't have a solvent. So everything is much faster in our life. But their relative folding rates are actually very similar to that what you find in experiments. In fact, after that, we folded many, many proteins, and some of them, these four, they have never been uh, folded uh, by Anton. I don't know if you heard about Anton. Uh, D.E. Shaw is a billionaire who spent uh, some uh, major amount, I think around $500 million, to build a customized computer just for one thing, to do traditional MD on proteins. And, uh, but this, these four proteins, I don't think they have ever, especially this one, they ne have never been folded by that uh, computer called Anton. Okay. All right. So when we build proteins and when we design proteins, how do we know that what we build is actually looks like a protein? Right? So because what we do, we rely on energy function that tells us, well, this is the lowest energy function, and that's what we would uh, call the native or ground state of the protein. But how do we know that this is actually right? Because we rely on some artificial parameter, and this parameter is based on the energy function that is artificially derived. Right? So it can be right, it can be wrong, so in many cases it's actually wrong, and there are many, many problems with the structures that you predict. And as a result, we needed additional parameters that would tell us that something is right or something is wrong. And these three guys, uh, now the old professors, uh, and at that time they were students, they basically develop a way uh, to, figure out, uh, to, to figure out whether your protein looks like a protein. For example, they, they took many, many uh, high-resolution structures and compared how, uh, whether, uh, and computed various parameters such as how many holes inside they have, how, can pro how much uh, holes can proteins, natural proteins tolerate, how many unsatisfied hydrogen bonds they have, and so on. Turns out there, are, uh, what, uh, there is a very nice number for number of unsatisfied hydrogen bonds in a protein. What do you guys think it is? I usually tell my class when I teach that my answers are usually, uh, the answers to my questions are usually very simple. They either are zero or one. So you can easily guess that it's around, it's, it's probably at most one hydrogen bond that proteins can tolerate that is unsatisfied. So it's very important to have that parameter uh, present, as well as voids. And what's mostly common actually in uh, protein structures is, are clashes. So very often what you see in designs proteins is that there are various clashes. And this is, for example, this is a modeled protein. You see yellow. It means that atoms are clashing in your models. And when you have so many of them, it's not that trivial to resolve them. And so um, these guys decided to, de they developed this tool called Chiron uh, to resolve these clashes. And the way how they designed it, it was really a, a pinnacle of drinking scotch. 
in the evening. And the way how they did it, of course, they were thinking, how can we deal with so many uh, problems in the protein? Well, what you want to do is you want to potentially raise the temperature in order to relax it, right? And it was very late at night, uh, and I like to tell the story because it's like it's, these guys were really uh, were fanatics of the. They were they were consumed by this problem, and they were just sitting late at night. And I got a call at 2 a.m. when the things uh, two, 2 at night when the things actually start working. So what they figure out is following: Well, we want to raise the temperature of the protein. If we raise the temperature, then uh, in the simulations, then we of course will break all the bad contacts. Right? We will remove clashes. The problem with raising the temperature is you start melting secondary structure. So the helices start melt and the things start uh, breaking. And so then you uh, break the whole protein of the, uh, the whole structure of the protein. So what they've done is they introduced high heat exchange coefficients. So whatever energy was released from, that, from those clashes was immediately sucked out from the, from the uh, system. And as a result, um, that energy could not be dissipated to the near, nearby atoms and disrupt, for example, helices and melt helices. So that was really clever because within 20 minutes, they can resolve very complex, uh, 20 minutes and for very large proteins within an hour, they can resolve a lot of clashes, or all of the clashes in, uh, in proteins. None of the tools were able to do that. And that was really cool. So we published that story and uh, offered the server to the community. And now it's actually quite popular. It's called Chiron, and it's uh, available on our website. And as you can see, the time, time to perform the simulations were between three minutes to an hour for a very large protein. So this tool is available if you guys want to play. It's called Chiron. Uh, DOKHLab.org, you can go there and just register and play with it. It's kind of fun. <clears throat> one, so that allowed that, and as an example, I wanted to show you an ex uh, one example, um, a, a model of mu opioid receptor. My lab is one of the major direction in the lab. We are interested in pain perception. Um, you guys know what pain is, right? It's, uh, everybody think of as pain as something unpleasant. But it's you who make pain unpleasant. Pain is a signal that uh, your brain received from your body, and then you decide whether it's good or bad, right? And most cases we say, oh, pain is bad, we panic, and we like, really want to find a cure. In reality, if you disconnect the evaluation, it's probably the best cure for pain, for, for actually something uncomfortable. Um, but for those who don't like to do that, they like drugs like morphine or other drugs and stuff like that. The problem with morphine is you get addicted. And it's not the biggest problem, actually, with morphine. The biggest problem with morphine is actually constipation and, um, uh, and hyperalgesia. People who take morphine regularly, they become hypersensitive to pain, which is really a paradoxical situation. So uh, we have a consortium that is trying to understand how we can find new drugs that do not create the side effects. And as, I, I don't know if you heard that there is a major epidemic in the United States. Everybody basically who comes from war areas they, is treated with, uh, for PTSD um, with morphine and uh, opioids. And so there is really a need for new drugs. And we've been developing these drugs, and, but the first step is the main receptor that is signaling, hey, stop, stop feeling pain. And this receptor is myopid receptor. And based on, back in 2010 and 2011, we actually were able to build the structure of this protein, and it looks like this. It's a seven transmembrane helix, a helix protein. And uh, next year, the structure was solved crystallographically, and we uh, got the, uh, these two structures. They are aligned here. They are within 3.59 angstrom, fr uh, uh, angstrom from each other. So they are really, really close. And actually, the biggest difference is in this loop, the lead that comes and uh, it close in our state and open in, in, the, uh, in the crystal structure. But based on the structure, we were actually were, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, at that time we were blind, completely blind. Imagine that you don't know anything that like, the protein looks like. So we build the structure. And so that's what we believed was the right structure. Turns out it's a, it, it looks quite uh, close. <laughs> but then we were able to screen small molecules. And I'll describe how we did that. And we found few drugs that actually are working. And I'll show you if, you, if the slides will cooperate. I'll show you how they work. And, uh, 
And you see we found quite a few drugs that actually um, work quite nicely. Uh, uh, and this drug was screened through repurposing, as was described uh, in one of the talks yesterday. So we screened a large library of compounds that have been used for something else, and we found few that actually show efficacy in living cells. Now these compounds are being pursued in, in, a, in a company, and hopefully soon they will hit the market. Uh, the nice thing about the tool, the force field that Medusa that I was describing, is that you can actually predict changes, uh, changes in stability in proteins. And that has been a holy grail of protein design. Why it's important is because if you want to design a protein, you are sitting there on a computer, you draw a, a structure that you want to have, for example, a star or, or anything you want, uh, but then you want to put a sequence there amino acid sequence that would support that structure. So you want to make sure that amino acids that you put there will contribute uh, negatively, so that it will increase the stability of the protein. And Shani Yin, who is now uh, in Broad Institute, uh, he basically developed uh, uh, this tool based on our force field and was able to predict delta delta G changes in stability upon mutation uh, quite nicely. And the way how he did this is he introduced flexib flexibility in the proteins. And because of the flexibility into proteins, he could substitute small amino acid by large amino acid, for example, alanine by tryptophan. So, and this way you can actually relax this, um, uh, the, the structure by introducing small to large uh, amino acid. Before that, there were tools and described here, Foldex, Demutant, and so on, they were also predicting delta delta G. But as soon as you start substitutions uh, of small amino acid to large ones, you would not perform well because that those tools deal with rigid backbone. They, the backbone is not allowed, of the protein is not allowed to move. And what we were able to do is to relax the backbone and chill so it can actually adapt to a new sequence. And because of that, performance of the algorithm became uh, much higher. Now it's extremely popular tool. We actually have thousands of subscribers. So if you're ever interested in predicting changes in stability of proteins or predicting, or for example, if you're interested in genomics or the impact of mutations on, the, on a disease, what the mutation does to a, a, a protein, you can estimate the delta delta G. Turns out, it's a side story, is majority of mutations um, that are involved in human diseases, we surveyed around 20 at least, uh, all of them, majority of them actually uh, negatively impact stability of the proteins. And I would argue majority of the mutations are due to the stabilization of the protein. And then you have loss of function and everything else. So this tool is called ARIS. For some reason, it's again exited the presentation mode. Ah, okay. No, no, it works. Okay. So the next tool that I'll describe is uh, called virtual screening in Medusa Doc. Um, all right. So um, if you want to now, the next goal that we had is to screen small molecules uh, inside the pockets of the protein. So what do we need to do for that? We need to put small molecule inside the protein and evaluate energies. And as you can see, the, uh, that uh, when we evaluate energy, we develop a tool called Medu a scoring function called Medusa Doc. It's very it's based on Medusa, but we added a lot of more new atoms that we would not find in proteins, but exist in small molecules. Of course, the correlation between the scoring function and PKD is much worse, and the reason for this is very simple. It's very hard to measure PKD accurately. So there is a lot of error here, but of course there is a lot of error here. Nevertheless, that was at that time that was one of the best uh, uh, prediction, uh, the scoring function that exists for the small molecules. Of course, that means that whenever we predict <coughs> energies of small molecules, when we do virtual screening, we have a lot of false positives and false negatives. So we will need to deal with that. And that's the art of uh, dr drug design or drug screening is dealing with inaccuracy in the force field. The, but the major problem with the force field is not even scoring function. The major, there are two major problems. First is that 
uh, the ligand, so if you, this is a protein, sorry for my drawing, I'm not really a good artist. I, I like photography because of that, because I want to find a shortcut to the art. But in terms of painting, that's as much as I can do. <laughs> so this is a drug, a ligand, and this is the protein. And so the problem with uh, ligands is that they explore a very large conformational space. They have a lot of rotatable bonds, and the more rotatable bonds they have, the more conformational space we need to explore. Proteins, on the other hand, not only they are flexible, they undergo conformational change upon binding to the ligand. And majority of the tools that actually, all the tools that I know that have been developed for drug, screen, drug uh, screening or docking, they perform rigid drug docking. So you take a small molecule and you stick it inside. But because you evaluate energy or scoring function based on the distances between donor and acceptor, it's all wrong because they all, uh, the distances are off because they undergo conformational change. So if, uh, and people knew that that's a problem, so they developed what's called ensemble docking, where the protein moves, they generate a bunch of conformations of the protein, generate a bunch of conformations of the ligand, and then perform rigid docking again. So no matter what you do, you just increase the sample size, but you still do rigid docking. You don't mimic induced feed. And so what we decided to do is to circumvent these two problems in the following in the following scenario, sorry. So this, this should be a movie and should be showing how to, it works, but it doesn't matter. So basically what we do first step is generate a stochastic library of conformations for the ligand called Stroll. And the idea here is basically simple Monte Carlo exploration of conformational space for the ligand. Just checking out what is available to this uh, small molecule. Then what we'll do, we'll perform uh, coarse docking to this, uh, to a protein, just to find where the small molecule can bind. We sort and group this uh, output and then perform to the most likely docking site, um, actual fine docking where everything moves, both the protein and the ligand, they can actually sample, uh, sample together conformational space. And afterward, uh, we rank the positions, the, the docking states, and uh, further can evaluate what, what is going on with that molecule. That's how algorithm works. Um, I don't know if, uh, yeah, unfortunately this movie is not working, but basically this is the initial state of the molecule when we perform docking, the uh, purple one, and the gray one is the crystal structure. And what you would see in this movie, so let's turn on our imagination, uh, is that this molecule will start move and eventually will coincide with black one, okay? And because of that, we allow everything to move and adjust to each other. And if you, uh, what's nice about the sampling during this process is that if you plot binding energy versus root mean square deviation, so basically the distance between these two molecules, initially it will be somewhere far away but eventually, it, you see it has a funnel-like shape, it will converge to the low energy state, which corresponds to the native state, to the ground state, which is nice, right? Because that allows us to search in a, among many, confirm, uh, many drugs for the one which has best or lowest energy, uh, best score or lowest energy state. Is there a way to make it, a, uh, to, to put it as a full slide? Because this is a movie. I have a lot of movies, unfortunately. But this is actually, I wanted to show an example of actual uh, virtual drug screening against a target protein called cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. It's a key protein in uh, cystic fibrosis disease, uh, and I'll sh show you in a second. You see, any time we put a drug, the pocket where it sits changes. So the pocket sh is shaped by the drug. And it tells you immediately that you cannot do rigid docking. You cannot just stick a small molecule and expect that your energies will be correct. You have to actually simulate changes in the structure of the pocket and the ligand together. Okay? And because of that, let's talk about cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is uh, actually an interesting disease, 90% uh, of the cases are due to the loss of uh, channel function, uh, channel called CFTR, it's chloride ion channel that pipes, uh, that uh, basically uh, moves chloride ions 
from outside, uh, from inside of epithelial cells to outside of epithelial cells. Epithelial cells, they uh, cover our lungs, guts, reproductive systems. So if, um, we, uh, if CFTR has a mutation, then what happens is that uh, instead of tr uh, translocating to Golgi, where it gets from the endoplasmic reticulum, where it gets glycosylated, so the sugar is added, uh, and translocated to, uh, to plasma membrane, where it actually offers its function, which is uh, providing uh, chloride ions out to outside of membrane. Instead, it gets de degraded, and it's all due to one single mutation, deletion of phenylalanine 508. And so if that happens, the patient or the uh, person that does, uh, is incapable of adding negative ions to the environment. For example, in humans, it manifested, the disease is manifested in lungs. So people usually die from lung failure. But, in other, but also there are major problems with guts and reproductive system and everything else. So, um, and it's interesting. The reason why that happens is because when chloride ions are not pumping out, uh, the mucus that surround our lungs becomes stale. So it becomes very viscous. And as disgusting as it sounds, we in exhale around 20 liters of mucus per day. That helps circulation of bacteria out, or an infection out of our uh, lungs. Now, if mucus becomes viscous, it traps bacteria, and they form biofilms, right? We can treat, and we develop infections. We develop infections, we can treat them with, with antibiotics for some time, but then bacteria develop resistance. And eventually, that leads to uh, serious problems with lungs, and people eventually die from the disease. Back in 2008, we were able to build a structure uh, computationally um, of this protein called cystic CFTR. Turns, uh, turns out uh, it's, it's a beast to solve, and only this year, cryo-EM structures of this protein have appeared. It's, it's an interesting protein. Turns out the deletion of 508 is here, in the, between the transmembrane helix coming here. So here is the membrane. These are transmembrane helices. This is nucleotide binding domains. And the channel is right here, it's through the middle of this protein. There is disordered R domain. Actually, the R domain is totally wrong. The R domain is disordered, and it's located right here. So we were off with the R domain. But the rest of the protein was OK. So, but the deletion of 508 is right here. And it looks like it mediates interactions between transmembrane helices and cytoplasmic re region, nucleotide binding domains. So how can we prove it? So we build a structure. Imagine you build something on a computer. How can you believe that? I don't believe anything I build on a computer. Because it's, it's uh, imagination, right? So it's just computer-aided, uh, you know, what your mind constructs. So we decided to look at what happens in the interface. And I apologize for the quality of the slides. Usually they seem much better. This phenylalanine 508 is surrounded by very similar aromatic residues. And these aromatic residues, they form what's called pie stacking. They, have, they form very strong interactions, and it's, it's a quantum effect. <coughs> and they hold this structure together. So when you remove it, you actually disrupt quite significantly the structure. So in order to prove it, we introduced um, over 30 different mutations. We introduced pairs of cysteines. We created a cysless construct. Cysteines are nice because the cysteines, they can cross-link. Right? So if we cross-link, we know that we were right in terms of the distance. If we don't cross-link, we were wrong in terms of the distance, right? In terms of our prediction. And so we're able to cross-link. So you see, in all 30 cases, you will see this band here. The plus, you, don't, you probably don't see this plus, but plus means DTT, something that, remove, uh, that removes the, the cross-link. And when you remove cross-link, there is no cross-link, there is no band. When you remove that uh, DTT, this uh, reducing agent, you'll see the crosslink. And it works like a charm with all these 30, 30 different experiments. And if you map all these 30 different experiments to how much structural information we get, turns out at least this part of the structure we predict within two angstrom, RMSD. 
Bear in mind, completely blindly. So that was not bad. What was interesting is that these are, these are basically biochemical studies, but then we decided to look what happens in living cells. Actually, uh, we took a piece of lung of the patient, I mean, deceased patient, and looked what happens to the function of that lung. And you see if, the, if you have uh, cross-linked, cross um, sorry, if you have wild type, which is normal CFTR, it functions quite normally. So you have spike, which means the current goes through the channel. Now, when we introduce the, uh, our cross-link construct, it, uh, it uh, functions fine, but as soon as you introduce cross-link, the function disappears. When you add DTT, which is reducing agent and removes cross-link, it starts functioning again. So now that was a disaster, actually, because on one hand, we rescued the stability of the protein. We introduced the crosslink, and it brought the protein to the transmembrane region. So everything was great. We made it. We actually rescued the life of the protein, but we made it functionally irrelevant. It lost its function. It's like we were sticking a stick in a bicycle uh, wheel, right? So that was telling us that the dynamics of the protein is very important. Not only the structure, but the dynamics of the protein was very critical in order to f for this protein to function. And so we needed the key how we can control the dynamics of the protein, A, and B, how to find a drug that, does not, that, uh, that rescues the protein but not kills its function by doing so. Does it make sense? All right. So, uh, so th what we decided to do is to find a way, what's called allosteric way, um, to control this protein. So allosteric means that all proteins are allosteric in a sense. So if you think about protein, here's your active site, and turns out very often this active site is controlled through the distance by a ligand or something else from the other side. So if we can find this uh, allosteric site that controls the active site here, in our case, the, the, uh, the phenylalanine 508 site, then we can actually potentially rescue the protein through a distance. In fact, Current pharmaceutical strategies, uh, companies, they are searching for strategies for allosteric rescue or controlling or inhibiting of protein function. Because this, the isosteric sites were actual active sites, it's dangerous to target them because they're under evolutionary pressure. For example, cancer drugs, you don't want to target active sites because active sites are constantly under evolutionary pressure. So only those cancer cells survive who can kick out the drug, and that's what happens. For example, I don't know if you heard about drug Iresa that targets uh, uh, tyrosine kinase uh, that is misbehaving in cancer. So as soon as you introduce uh, Iresa, patient feels much better, tumors disappear for a year, and then they come back with a vengeance because uh, uh, cancer cells under evolutionary pressure find a compensating mutation that kicks out a drug and the patient dies from the disease because you make actually a stronger cancer cells that can survive that. So we want to find something allosteric that doesn't bind to 508, but bind from far away. So for that, we perform simulations to see what happens, and uh, actually with nucleotide binding domain. Turns out, that sto long story short, is that this uh, phenylalanine 508 is actually coupled uh, if you perform covariation analysis, how the fluctuations of the residues uh, work, uh, turns out that this phenylalanine phenyl 508 is actually coupled to regulatory insertion region, which is uh, located uh, quite at a distance uh, from each other, uh, from 508 region. And so the idea that uh, in, in, in uh, delta F508 mutants, you see the fluctuations of this region is much higher uh, and the coupling is stronger. And if you look at the wild type CFTR, so this is a protein that is uh, at, uh, where you have green fluorescent protein attached, GFP attached. You see it's on the surface of the, of the cell. It's in the cytoplasm too, but it's also on the surface of the cell. So this is a healthy cell. When you have a deletion of 508, there is nothing present on the surface. So the protein is internalized. It never actually gets to the surface, and that's the problem, right? So our goal was to rescue this protein by just trying to inhibit this connection, allosteric connection between the 
uh, what this region called regulatory insertion and delta F side. So what we've done, we realized that this is just, uh, uh, we can reduce the entropy here, so we can change the, uh, the fluctuations here, but it reducing fluctuations here. All we did is that we cut it. By cutting it, we just reduce the entropy, right? We remove the loop. And so let's see what happens to a protein. Oops. Okay, is, there, is it possible? Ah, you know what? Is it possible to go to presentation mode for a second? Yeah. Yeah, so if you um, delete uh, this region delta ri, you'll see that cell is rescued. In fact, we rescued it to a better state than even in wild type. It's a great proof of principle that you can rescue the protein through allosteric. Unfortunately, that's not a viable pharmaceutical strategy because that entails gene editing, okay? But that tells us that we can actually target this region using small molecules. Meanwhile, uh, my student, uh, actually, that has been published. Uh, she started, uh, she wanted to identify regions that connect uh, between a 508 site and the rest of the site. Uh, and so she used graph theory, where she built graphs of interaction, uh, or based on the, uh, where nodes are the residues of the protein, and the bonds are the edges, uh, the covariation values between residues uh, with corresponding weights. And then she pruned the network where uh, she considered only subgraphs with covariations higher than certain value some certain threshold. And it's a long story how we identified this threshold, but it's, it's, it's doable. And then if you look at the connectivity between 508 site and the regulatory insertion site, you'll see that there are many paths, but there are definitely hubs in this path. In this case, it's 492 and 445. So the idea was is to disrupt this network of communication between these distal sites by affecting the hubs in the network. And that would be the ultimate proof that we have an allosteric protein. So she did that, and she introduced mutation uh, uh, from uh, serine to proline. And what proline does, proline is amino acid, so it actually has a very stiff backbone. And as a result, it dampens the fluctuations that are induced on either side of the protein. So when we introduce this, uh, we actually rescue the protein. So this is wild type. And with, uh, this is delta F508. You see it's absent on the cell surface. But when we introduced a uh, mutation to proline, it rescues CFTR. And in fact, it rescues its function. OK? So allosteric works. All right. Let's switch gears to something much more exciting, uh, namely engineering protein allosteric. How we can actually not just detect allosteric, but actually make use of it make use of it for controlling proteins. <clears throat> and what I'll do, I'll describe a story of kinases. Kinases are very important molecules that uh, actually exist in these two states. Uh, unfortunately, these are two slides and one slide, so is, if it's possible to put this in presentation mode. So the idea is that uh, these proteins, they're signaling molecules that exist in two states. Uh, closed states, where you have auto-inhibitory domain, AID, covering kinase domain, which is an active, active domain. They coexist in these two states, except that this state is very rare. And because of that, these molecules are usually, they are signaling, typically signaling molecules. They communicate to, each other, to other molecules in the cell by opening, becoming active, and phosphorylating downstream proteins. So in most cases, in most, most of the time, these proteins are in auto-inhibitory state. So the idea is that if we want to, and these molecules do everything in, in cells. They, uh, they involved in, in, uh, in uh, signaling, in uh, cell motility, in proliferation, and anything you want. You can imagine there is no process that, uh, in cells that doesn't involve a kinase. It's a major group of proteins. And so we were interested in controlling them. So if we want to control them, we want to, A, first, redesign the auto-inhibitory domain that this protein becomes constitutively active, right? Then, then what we want to do, we want to introduce something 
some other part in the kinase domain that will render kinase domain inactive. And then you can have two strategies. One strategy, you can uh, introduce light that would trigger conformational change in the kinase domain that would uh, switch that kinase domain from inactive to active. In this case, it's sterically. It was published in Nature back in 2009. Or you introduce a drug, and because of drug, it makes the kinase domain active. And so light is great because you can shine light on living cells, and uh, cells immediately, instantaneously, become, you can see exhibited phenotype, right? The great thing about drug, if you, can, if you, if you deal with organisms, and you, for example, study brain, you don't want to drill a hole in a skull in order to shine light. It's much easier to feed the animal with a drug that would trigger uh, conformational change. So this story was also published some time ago. So what we've, uh, we've, uh, we look for, uh, we, uh, we need to, um, uh, as an example, we looked for uh, focal adhesion uh, pro processes. So focal adhesions are these pyramidal structures on the self uh, 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 leading edges of the cells that interact with other cells or cellular matrix. And uh, focal adhesion kinase is a major player in these pyramidal structures. When it's activated, typically it's arrested and it's not active. But when it's activated, it disassembles from focal adhesions and uh, cells become detached from the rest of the uh, uh, cells or from cellular matrix and becomes mobile. When does it happen? During metastasis during cancer, right? So if we want to understand cancer and metastasis, we want to understand how this protein works. So we want to put it under control to see what chain of events happen in the system. So in order to understand focal adhesion kinase, um, we perform simulations to uncover what region, uh, regions uh, are coupled to this active site of the protein called g -loop. And if you look at, again at co variation, uh, co variation analysis in our simulations, you'll find that this G-loop is uh, highly connected, uh, actually negatively correlated to what we call insertion loop. And this is more than 10 angstrom distance. So the fluctuations here, wherever it's happening here, affects the activity of this protein. So that was great, because what we would do here, we would cut this loop and insert something that would control this protein. We decided to look at nature, at what nature has developed in or, uh, uh, that binds a drug. Turns out there is a great complex called FKBP-FRB that binds to, uh, these two proteins are bound to each other in the presence of a small molecule called rapamycin. The binding affinity is around less than nanomolar. Unfortunately for us, this FKBP was very stable, but through redesign, we basically removed 20 residue tail, this protein becomes less stable, Nevertheless, when you add a drug, it still uh, recruits FRB, and the complex becomes stable again. The nice thing about this truncation is because C and N termini become uh, close to each other, so we can actually use that in order to insert inside the protein. Okay? You need something that is close. So if you look at specific heat which basic, uh, versus temperature, which tells you about energy fluctuations of the protein, if you see a peak, it means the uh, fluctuations are the largest, right? And when is the fluctuations the largest? Is when protein uh, samples two states simultaneously, folded and unfolded, right? So in folded state, there is large energy, uh, internal energy in unfolded state is uh, small, right? So there is a big change. Right? And that's why there is peak. So peak indicates where the proteins fold. This is the folding temperature. So green is the original, uh, uh, sorry, black is the original protein. And then we truncate it, it becomes unstable, and that's what we want. But when we add drug, the green, it restores the stability. So the idea would be, and now if we can go to presentation mode again, uh, the idea would be following. So we would insert this domain, uh, and if you can click on it. Yeah. Oh, I don't know why it's not working. All right. But the idea would be following. It's okay. Um, is basically 
because of the fluctuations of the, it, it was a movie with simulations, so it would be fun to see, but it's okay. So uh, this uh, protein would f uh, fluctuate a lot without a drug, and as a result, this red loop uh, would fluctuate as well, and the protein would be inactive. When you add a drug, it would recruit FRB, and you would have a stable complex without, without much fluctuation. As a result, this loop becomes less mobile. And it's, in simulations, it's, it looks very striking. However, uh, we don't know how it would work in experiments. So we would go, we went and done experiments. Is it possible to click on it? I don't know what is going on, but it's, uh, it's not showing. But basically, let me describe this movies. Uh, this is the cell without a drug. When you add drug, you will see dorsal protrusion. So basically, cells start shooting arms at various regions of this uh, cell. And that's because you activate focal adhesions. It's a really cool movie. Unfortunately, you cannot see it. Now, if you want to make it much more exciting, you can introduce, uh, you can cage a drug, that dropamycin. So in collaboration with uh, Alex Dieters from now University of Pennsylvania, he introduced, um, uh, he's a chemist, so he introduced a group that uh, protects rapamycin, this drug, from interacting with our protein. But the kick uh, from, that, uh, from that addition is that it's cleavable. So if you shine light, that group leaves and you have a, a pure rapamycin. So what we can do, we can pre-incubate our cells with caged rapamycin, nothing happens. Then we shine light, we uncage uh, rapamycin, and it can bind to kinase domain, sorry, to the, our, uh, uni, uh, to, to our uh, complex and make the protein active. So instead of controlling the, the protein activity with a drug, we now control it with a light. Okay? It's cool? All right. So that's, uh, and can we go again to presentation? Well, I have a lot of movies here. Yeah. You see, this is now we introduce cage rapamycin to living cells. So this is again a focal adhesion kinase. Nothing happens. Now we start treating with UV light. It takes time, a little bit time, to uncage the drug. But as soon as we uncage, you will see there is a bunch of dorsal protrusions also start coming out because cells start to become mobile. And if you put it in a context, it start moving between cells. All right. That system was too complex. If you show it to biologists, they say, well, listen, uh, you have one protein, you have another protein, you have to introduce a drug. So it's, to do these experiments in living cells, you have to have too many controls. Can you guys make one protein? And so I had a student from Turkey uh, who is absolutely brilliant, uh, Anur Daglian, who basically uh, decided, and it was his rotation project. So we have a system of, rot of rotations. Incoming students, they have three months with uh, each PI. So one PI has, uh, in one lab, he has three months in another lab and another lab. So, and afterwards he chooses or she chooses a lab where she wants or he wants to do PhD. So he came to my lab and we typically give high risk, high return projects to the students because it A, challenges them and, you know, it's nothing to lose, right? You do a rotation project. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. So it was something that I didn't believe it would work because nobody believed in the lab it would work. But we decided, and he got one shot, right? So he came and redesigned the protein, and so he basically connected these two proteins. And uh, the challenge here was that it's not just to connect them, but to ma not make it too stable, actually to destabilize it. So it was a two-state design. He simultaneously was optimizing two structures, folded and unfolded states. Why it's important? Because you want the protein to be unfolded without a drug. And then he had only one experiment, right? So he can make only one construct. He did. And turns out, and yeah, so, but, uh, so, so from a mechanistic point of view, instead of now adding a drug and it would recruit FRB, so it's a multi-component system, all you do is you add a drug and your uh, protein, we call it uniwrapper, undergoes conformational change and it makes target protein active from inactive. So he made this construct, uh, again, from simulation perspective, sorry, Everything looked really great. Uh, again, specific heat shows that without rapamycin, the protein is 
less stable, but when you add rapamycin, it becomes stable. If you look at the fluctuations of the protein, uh, without a drug, it's all over the place. So it, this is the distribution of distances between the lobes of the protein, and it's all over the place. When you add a drug, it peaks in a particular distance. Okay? So everything looks good. So then he makes a protein. And look at this. It's really amazing. So without a drug, the protein is inactive. But you add a drug, the protein is active. This is a, a, a phosphorylation assay where we check phosphorylation of downstream protein called paxilin. And if you see a, a phosphorylation of the tyres in 31, it means that our focal adhesion is working. Okay? And it works. We had a bunch of controls. Not only that, he decided to prove that this methodology is transferable to other kinases. So he put it in focal adhesion kinase, P38, PAC1, and PAC2. So we had many, many kinases. It works like a charm. I never seen anything works like this, all or none. So that was really cool. Does it work in cells? Uh, this is not a movie, so that's okay. So we, st we studied uh, SARC. SARC protein uh, actually is very critical for um, cell growth and expansion, so it's actually uh, regulated by SARC. And you can see it's really great, so before and after. So it's like uh, dieting uh, pictures before and after, except that it's opposite. Uh, so that's with activation of SARC. And this is a movie, if we can put it on. And that's really cool. So uh, he discovered a new phenotype. If you add rapamycin, look what happens. Cells start exhibiting. It's like, unfortunately a short-term movie that I wanted, but it's cell-exhibited polarized spreading. So it starts spreading in one direction. Yeah. So, and that's what's very important in cancer cells, is that you have a directionality in spreading. It, the cells start moving towards blood vessels, where it can actually propagate throughout the body. Um, and in order to make a slam dunk sort of uh, story here, we contacted uh, our collaborator, Anna Huttenlocker, in the University of Wisconsin, who created a transgenic zebra fish. And then the experiment is extremely easy. You just feed a fish rapamycin in the aquarium. You just add rapamycin to aquarium. And she studies uh, EMT, ep uh, uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition, where you have polarized uh, cells. They become depolarized and start spreading um, in zebrafish. And so basically, after introduction of rapamycin, the cell-cell contact starts being lost. Um, this technology is also transferable to um, light, using uh, in light activatable uh, technology. In this case, we introduce, um, when you introduce a light, we deactivate the protein, and you see the protein starts, uh, the cell starts shrinking. And that's exactly what happens with SARC. Remember, uh, with SARC, cells uh, change size. All right. With that, um, actually, I have exactly zero seconds left. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, the whole next story. Uh, and the whole next story was about RNA. And I'll just mention that RNA is an amazing set of, uh, mo is an amazing, RNA is an amazing molecules. Um, I started uh, in biophysics as protein person. I started studying proteins, and proteins are fascinating. But proteins are, in a sense, easy. Proteins have, the peptide bond has two major uh, angles. It's phi and psi, and if you know uh, Ramachandran plot, you know that there are only small regions of this phase space where this um, uh, phi and psi can take, can be. And so proteins, in a sense, are very confined in what conformations it can assume. RNA has seven angles, and the seven angles remind me the uh, black square of Malevich. It's just everything is possible. So RNA is extremely flexible molecule. Not only that, uh, RNA is extremely interesting in biologically. Proteins are workhorse of the cell. They do everything. But RNA regulate what proteins do. And what's interesting, 90% and 10, only 10% 10 of RNA that is expressed in cell code for proteins. 90% of uh, RNA that express in cell, nobody knows what they do. And they called 
the dark matter of biology. And nobody knows what they do, and it's interesting that function is potentially tied to its structure. Therefore, there is a critical need to figure out the structure of RNA. But because of its flexibility, it's extremely, extremely difficult to identify the structure. And as a result, there is now a major effort to figure out structure of RNA. And my lab has made significant strides to figure out how to build structure of RNA for small ones, and we are learning how to incorporate experimental constraints to build large RNA structures. And that was small sort of vignette story about that. I'm going to skip all of that because it's actually a really fascinating story, but it's a major part of my lab that does that. And I'll just go directly to the, uh, sorry, I'm going to go to conclusions uh, here, is that uh, discrete molecular dynamics is an, an alternative approach to do uh, simulations of uh, proteins to traditional MD. It's very fast, and it allows you to sample conformations of molecules at the, on, on your laptop, and actually quite, quite efficiently. And using that, we can actually build proteins, sample how they move, how they, uh, how they uh, behave or misbehave, and allow you to study diseases such as ALS or cystic fibrosis. You can design proteins, especially design something really fun, like put proteins under control. We are now working on controlling motors. You can imagine creating soldiers inside living cells that would carry stuff and march from one side of the cell to another. So it sounds like sci-fi, but I'm telling you this sci-fi is not far away. And so there is a lot of possibilities right now that really mind-boggling. And develop tools to uh, model RNA structure. Um, that's a uh, lab in a, uh, some time ago. Uh, I would like to mention a few names. Anur Daglian, who is now at Harvard, who was basically responsible for controlling proteins inside living cells, who basically for whom it was a rotation project. Afterwards, he's done many, many wonderful things. Uh, David Shervanians, he, is from, um, he, he, he actually got two PhDs, which is interesting. But he is now, he decided to build, uh, his he is now in startup with Joe DeSimone. I don't know if you saw, there, is, there was a TED talk by Joe DeSimone of building, uh, it's a liquid uh, printing, Three, liquid 3D printing. Basically, if you remember Terminator, a movie where Schwarzenegger appears out of liquid, so that's what he's doing. It's actually the future is now, it's amazing. Lisa Proctor, who is uh, an amazing scientist who came to the lab as an astrophysicist, didn't know anything about proteins, she is also an amazing athlete because she was, uh, I think she is uh, one of the, she's a pole vaulter, this uh, person who jumps with a stick. Uh, but she was so determined to learn uh, biology that by the time she graduated the lab, she published 19 papers and, and done both computation and experiment. She is now at MIT doing surgeries on mice, embryos. It's very interesting. Um, uh, Rachel Redler, who has done a lot of work on uh, ALS, but she's now at NYU. And, uh, and Pradeep, who was uh, working on CFTR, he is now at UNC. Uh, and let me just mention that I don't like to brag about things, but this book is not about uh, the fact that I edited this book. But I actually, uh, this is an educational talk I usually recommend it to students. I recommend it to my students. It's a collection of articles of how to model biological systems using stru in structural biology. It's very popular. A lot of my students use it, and a lot of other students use it. Um, great people uh, contributed chapters to this book. So if you want to get some sort of perspective of what it's all about, you can take a look. With that, thank you very much for listening and bearing with me uh, for, with these uh, complications with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one short question. Или по-русски? Один вопрос. Неважно. Скажите, пожалуйста, вот какие методы вы считаете наиболее подходящими для двух задач? Первое это моделирование отсутствующих петель в белке, и вторая это докинг больших молекул, таких как, ну, вроде НАД, ФАД, таких уже молекул, в которых много степеней свободы. Спасибо. Для симуляции петель 
Я, я очень байс. То есть мы делаем своими с DMD, потому что у нас как бы много опыта работы с, с, с нашей программой, с Discrete Molecular Dynamics. И Force Field работает, мы, его, мы, мы знаем, как он работает. Но и, и кроме того, sampling, sampling time scales, они довольно-таки большие. Мы можем sample seconds при помощи DMD. Uh, having said that, это не означает, что traditional MD would not work. It would work probably even better, может быть. Я не знаю. Но мы используем наши, uh, наш, uh, наши симуляции, и особенно потому, что uh, мы делаем очень много симуляций больших петель, uh, когда, uh, so, когда у нас есть проекты по антителам, где мы пытаемся найти, как антитела связываются, с, скажем, с, uh, с различными белками, или там uh, toll-like receptors, for example, связываются с uh, белками и так далее как это все регулируется. Поэтому как, как двигаются петли для нас очень важно, особенно большие. Для этого мы используем наши tools. Но в принципе я уверен, что можно и традиционными, традиционными симуляциями это делать, только надо делать очень длинные симуляции. Что касается docking tools, я хочу сделать pitch к, свое, к другу своему, его зовут Дима Казаков, который разработал очень, он тоже физтех бывший, он сейчас а, в Нью-Йорке, в Стони Брук. И он разработал потрясающе, он постоянно побеждает в Капри а, соревнованиях по докинг. И идея у него очень простая, он, он а, делает Фурье трансформ а, поверхности и дальше делает матч, гармоник. И это очень красиво. И он при этом энумерует все состояния, то есть он может посчитать partition function и посчитать вероятность, что будет связывание там и так далее. То есть у него очень такой clever physics-based tool, который работает очень хорошо. Вот. И то есть мы использовали его tools для того, чтобы делать docking of large molecules. Если у вас сложности возникают, не когда вы делаете docking больших молекул, там уже большая комьюнити есть, которая делает это. Проблемы возникают с маленькими молекулами, а еще хуже с пептидами. И сейчас самый ход subject — это даже не пептиды, потому что пептиды как фармацевтическая стратегия, она не очень хорошая. А microcycles, я не знаю, если вы слышали про microcycles, но microcycles — это то, что выделяют бактерии, растения в защиту от друг друга. Вот. Это такие вот а, пептиды, которые связаны в, а, в такие кружки, и они а, модифицированы, то есть не, это не совсем нативные аминокислоты. В результате чего они имеют очень интересные структуры, они могут связываться с белками с большой аффинити и влиять на их функцию. Вот их предсказание сейчас, то, над чем очень многие лаборатории пытаются работать, это RACE, uh, to get it first. А как называется его программа? Не помню. Ну, Дима Казаков. То есть, Казаков, если посмотрите, вот Docking и Дима Казаков, Google вам отдаст, выдаст его сервер наверняка. Спасибо.